Hi, welcome. Uh, this is a special Knockmas uh, edition uh, where we're going to interview an author who has a new book coming out. Um, and today our guest is going to be uh, Dr. Jason Brownlee, uh, who's an associate professor in the Department of Government at the University of Texas, Austin. And um, he's just written his second book, uh, which will be coming out with Cambridge University Press uh, in July or August of 2012. The title of the book is called Democracy Prevention, The Politics of the Egyptian-American Alliance. Um, and I had an opportunity to read the book uh, this past week. It's uh, inc written incredibly well, and what we want to do today is um, help spotlight this forthcoming work uh, and, 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 and lay out some of the important contributions that the book makes. So. Um, Jason, why don't we start off with the title? Um, you know, I think that uh, what when many people and Americans hear about democracy in the Middle East, they tend to think of it as democracy promotion. Um, so you want to explain the title and the core argument of the book? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, first, thanks for, for doing this interview with me. I'm, I'm really happy to talk about the book. And yeah, the title is a flip on the typical idea of democracy promotion. With democracy promotion, we think about the U.S. encouraging the opposition to come to power, helping uh, people change their regimes in a more democratic direction. And that may happen in some cases. I think it mainly happens in cases where... Uh, the regime in power may be considered an adversary of the United States, places like the Ukraine and Georgia before their colored revolutions. Um, <clears throat> in the case of Egypt and other strategic allies, what we see is really the opposite. We see support for authoritarian regimes rather than support for the opposition. And the, the core argument of the book is along those lines, mainly that since the consolidation of the U.S.-Egyptian alliance in 1979, uh, since that time, the U.S. has participated in the reproduction of authoritarianism in Egypt mm -hmm. rather than the fostering of democracy. And actually, U.S. interests and U.S. actions have run counter to democracy in Egypt. Okay, great. Um, and uh, this uh, seems to me uh, a bit counterintuitive, given the amount of rhetoric that one hears uh, coming out of Washington about um, so, sort of promoting democracy. So, for instance, um, you know, there's this moment where um, you talk about sort of the Clinton regime uh, or the Clinton presidency talking about, um, you know, democratic peace theory and pushing democracy at the same time that they're sort of initiating or originating the sort of extraordinary rendition program. Um, and then, you know, there's also the sort of famous moments uh, that were attached to the George W. Bush presidency um, uh, where, where there was a, a lot of um, pushing for elections and democratization. So can you explain how this um, helps replicate the authoritarianism uh, given the sort of rhetoric a a a that people are pushing in, inside the Beltway? Yeah, so one of the basic points of the book is that uh, we should listen to what U.S. officials and Egyptian officials and other officials have to say, but we should also look at what they do. And in many cases, we're going to find uh, a big contrast between words and deeds. And the main uh, metric for understanding whether the U.S. is promoting democracy or preventing it is really in the actions that U.S. policymakers take. So as you mentioned, during the 1990s, the Clinton administration began uh, a program known as Extraordinary Renditions, which involves abducting persons from uh, third countries, and basically in the, for U.S.-Egyptian relations, it meant U.S. and Egyptian agents transporting that, that person or those suspects to Egypt for interrogation and, in some cases, execution. And uh, that was going on at the same time that the Clinton administration was talking about the need to have more democracies around the world, the uh, policy of democratic enlargement, uh, and, uh, uh, and advocacy of the democratic peace. So on the surface, judging from Clinton's State of the Union addresses, you might think, oh, well, the U.S. is promoting democracy all over the place. But really, in terms of actions, it was... Quite, uh, quite a different story. And we even we know that from Clinton administration officials like Martin Indyk, who was the, the 
the point person for Middle East Affairs on the National Security Council under Clinton, and I have a couple of quotes uh, from Indec that are on the public record, where he, he said, basically, when it came to Egypt, we struck a bargain. We wanted to make sure this regime didn't lose power, that it wasn't threatened by Islamic militants, and we had no real problem with Mubarak brutally um, uh, oppressing his opponents. And uh, his opponents included not only militant Islamists, but also many peaceful activists as well. And so that's what was happening during the 1990s, uh, during the Clinton administration. Then with the Bush administration, this is another case, and a, a, a case that's in more recent memory, where you had a major program known as the Freedom Agenda, which comprised a series of speeches and policy initiatives that talked about the need to have more democracy and more freedom in the Middle East. But uh, behind the scenes, extraordinary renditions were continuing. In fact, they were expanding. There was steady security cooperation between Washington and Cairo. And, uh, and the U.S. continued to provide uh, unprecedented or really unparalleled aid to a, a strategic ally that is non-democratic. So that, that's what was going on, and that's a, a contrast that the book really brings to light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I, I think that, uh, you know, I've read the book. Uh, it's written extremely well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's free from sort of academic jargon, and uh, it, it really uh, uh, it, it, it tells a story that I think is really important given the sort of contemporary events that have been happening uh, in the Middle East uh, since December 2010, January 2011, what some people call the, the Arab Spring or... or, or, or probably better named uh, the, the Arab uprisings or the uprisings. So um, explain then um, Obama's position. I know that there are many people out there who um, I know from just giving talks around Cleveland and the country, when I tell them sort of that, that the Obama administration wasn't all that supportive of Democratic protesters, they look at me like that's not the story I've heard. So um, could you explain to people out there who think that maybe – uh, the United States stood with the sort of protesters uh, during the Egyptian uprising that lasted 18 days between January 25th and February 11th. Can you explain to the audience a bit um, what Obama's position was and how what we really witnessed was more continuity rather than, than some sort of democratic sort of change? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, continuity is really the, the, the key idea to, to focus on here. Although, when in U.S. political discourse, we're accustomed to thinking about there being tremendous differences between uh, the two major political parties, the Democrats and Republicans, and we think, well, when a new administration comes into power, they're going to be uh, comes into office. There's going to be all sorts of major changes. But when it comes to foreign policy and U.S. security policy, there's tremendous continuity across Democratic and Republican administrations, and that's something that. The chapters of the book show going from really the Nixon and Ford years all the way up through Obama's uh, presidency. And when it came, comes to the 2011 uprising in, in particular, what we see is that the Obama administration was basically engaged in damage control. They were trying to minimize the extent of change and the extent of, of uh, risk when it came to the political situation in Egypt and U.S.-Egyptian uh, strategic cooperation. So the reaction unfolded over uh, the first few days from January 25th through the first weekend where initially the Obama administration said, oh, things are stable, we think basically Mubarak's still in charge. Uh, oh, okay, maybe things aren't quite as stable as we thought. Uh, there should be an orderly transition. And by orderly transition, this was a phrase that Hillary Clinton rolled out on the first Sunday after the uprising began when she made appearances on uh, the Sunday morning uh, talk shows. By orderly transition, what the Obama administration had in mind was a handover to Omar Suleiman, the intelligence chief under Mubarak since 1993. And this was not going to be a democratic transition. This was not about bringing the opposition to power. Rather, it was uh, very much about minimizing the extent of change. 
And so when you say that the audiences that, that you've spoken with or that you've addressed are surprised to hear that Obama had such a conservative uh, reaction to the Egyptian uprising, I, I get that um, that reaction or, or that sort of that response from audiences as well. Because the, the final speech that Obama gave in terms of the Egyptian uprising on uh, February 11th, once Halsey Mubarak resigned, was that this was a history-changing event and the Egyptian people had been heard and we celebrate their victory, but the White House was really um, late in, in the game in, in reaching that position. Rather than proactively supporting the opposition and getting on their side from day one, they reactively advanced uh, a very limited leadership uh, change. And when it couldn't be a handover to Omar Suleiman, they were fine with it being a handover to the generals who are, continue to be in charge today. In terms of uh, uh, you know moving forward, uh, Egypt is having important presidential elections as we speak. How do you see the U.S.-Egyptian relationship um, maturing or developing uh, now that uh, there's been presidential elections in Egypt? The kind of core pillars of the relationship remain in place. Um, U.S. interest in Israeli security, U.S. interest in projecting military force to the Persian Gulf. And Egypt has been an uh, integral part of American strategy when it comes to those goals. And so I think the book is going to help us as we look forward and look ahead to the, in getting into the post-Mubarak period, it's going to help us see how those enduring interests continue to shape the U.S.-Egyptian relationship and U.S. participation in some very anti-democratic practices within Egypt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you're, essentially you're saying that you think the relationship will continue to kind of... Um, remain and, and thrive in the future, irrespective of what's going on with these sort of elected uh, officials coming into power. Yeah? Yeah, I think the, the relationship right now, as I describe in the book, is shaping the post-Mubarak period rather than being overturned by the loss of, of Mubarak. So basically, the, the investment that the U.S. has in strategic cooperation with Egypt and the need for the Egyptian military and Egyptian security officials to work with the United States is, is really circumscribing the extent of change after the Egyptian uprising. And I basically finished writing the book the end of um, 2011, I, but I, did, I do speak about relationships between the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF, and the Obama administration. And we see how they are, they're very close, they're very, there's a lot of cooperation going on between them, even though there's this kind of periodic rhetoric of maybe criticism between the two sides. That's very similar to what we saw during the George W. Bush years, where it looked like there was tension between Bush and Mubarak, but actually security cooperation was proceeding without interruption. Well, it's a, it's a really outstanding book. Uh, I hope that everybody buys a copy and reads it and uh, really gives you an insight into, um, you know, American foreign policy in this sort of age of sort of uh, unending empire in the Middle East. So thank you for coming on today and having this conversation with us and uh, um, best of luck with, 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 uh, with your next project. All right. Thanks so much for having me.